Hi, I'm Deanna Joe, and welcome to my channel, Responsible Faith. I titled this video, Must Christians Go to Church? And I know it's a controversial question, but just bear with me for a bit. Now, most Christians do, and that's great, but there are some who don't. Uh, what about them? You know, should they be going to church? So our modern definition of the word church is like a building where people go to worship. But in scripture, church comes from the Greek word ecclesia, and it's a two-part word. And the first part is ek, which means out from one thing and to something else, and kaleo, which means to call. So if you put that together, the proper definition in reference to the body of Christ would be people called out from the world, and to God. So that would be me as an individual, as well as all of us collectively, kind of the universal total body of believers that God has called out from the world and into his eternal kingdom. So it's us, the people, uh, not a building. And words do matter. If we read with a wrong preconceived definition of a word, it can really affect our understanding of a passage of scripture. And so the mental picture that many people get when they see the word church, when they're reading, is often our cultural definition. And they read it into the text, even though it was not the author's intended meaning. So when Christians say, I'm going to church, culturally, they're attending a building with other believers. But according to scripture, we are the church. So anytime Christians gather to worship and fellowship, I would contend that it's church. <laughs> um, another misconception is that it's important to be faithful to the house of God. I'm sure you've heard that before. And I think by that, they just basically mean you never miss a service if at all possible. But does this concept exist within scripture? No, it doesn't. It's important to be faithful to God and even to fellowship with other believers, but faithful attendance, um, it's, you know, as in never, ever missing a Christian gathering, that's not something scripture ever mentions. And I would also contend that your church building is not the house of God. You are. Um, Acts 7, 48 through 50, you have Stephen and he's addressing the Sanhedrin, which were the religious leaders of that day. And he told them that God can't be confined to a building. In verse 48, it said, yet the most high does not dwell in houses made by hands as the prophet said, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me? Says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? <laughs> so, you know, even in Acts 17, 24, you basically have the same thing repeated by Paul. And so we don't attend a building to meet with God. He's everywhere all the time. And he lives inside of us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And John 2, 21 was the first time that really came up. You had Jesus, and he was the first one to mention this concept. And so he had come into the temple. He was angry that his father's house or the temple had was becoming a marketplace or a den of thieves. And so he drove the money changers out of the temple. And the Jews were upset. I mean, they wanted to know by what authority are you doing this? And uh, we know the authority he had was the fact that he was God. And he was about to change that entire system of temple sacrifice by becoming the perfect once and for all sacrifice for sin. And he actually told them, like, this temple is coming down, not one stone left on another. It was about to become us. But what he said to them was, you destroy this temple and in three days I'll build it back up again. And they're still focused on the building. And they're like, it took 46 years to build this temple. But he wasn't speaking of the building. He was speaking of his body. Scripture says he was speaking about the temple of his body. First Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Second Corinthians 6.16, you have Paul. He was addressing the idolatry in Corinth. And he said, What agreement can exist between the temple of God and idols? Now, he wasn't talking about two competing buildings or places of worship. He was talking about the believers in Corinth, the people. 
He, and he goes on to say, for we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. So God dwells within us. And that is kind of a basic, beautiful principle of Christianity. So since we're God's temple and he dwells within us, do we need anybody else? Well, I mean, that depends. <laughs> it depends on what you're asking the question for. For salvation? No, absolutely not. We need, we need Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and that's it. But we were created for community and relationship. And there is strength in numbers. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, but a cord of three strands is not quickly or easily broken. And so again, strength in numbers. And I get it, you know, isolation can happen uh, due to situations beyond our control. And if you don't think it can happen to you, it can very easily happen. I mean, I've experienced it myself because of my health and it's very difficult to deal with. But at, if at all possible, fellowship with other believers is the ideal. And again, not to be saved, but for support and encouragement. Another picture of our relationship with Christ is as various members of his body with him at the head. And we all work together. And you can find that in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 26. So we do need each other. And I guess then the question is, what does that look like? Now, questioning traditional church attendance is usually not well received. Um, and the first verse that people tend to go to to quote to you is Hebrews 10, 25 which encourages us to gather with other believers, but they often skip verse 24, which sort of qualifies the reasoning behind it. And it says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So it sounds to me like Meeting together served to stir one another to love and good works and was for the purpose of encouraging one another. And the admonition was gentle. It was not harsh. It wasn't a box you check to maintain right standing with God, which I find is how it's often presented now. But it was meant to help us. And if you keep the persecution of the early church in mind, um, reading down verses 32 through 39, he encouraged them to hold to their faith, and he mentioned that they'd been through a lot. So that was part of the context there, too. And community was important for them, and I think it is for us. Now, this is where I tend to veer away from the traditional church community in my view of what acceptable gathering together and assembling looks like. I find much of the Christian community suffers from tunnel vision, and they can only imagine gathering being done in one way, their way, you know, the right way. But what we do now is not the early church model. And I read a book several years ago, this book, uh, Pagan Christianity by Frank Viola. I've said before, this is an excellent book, not necessarily endorsing Frank Viola, but this is a good book. Um, and I just wanted to share a few points with you just for consideration. So church buildings were initially constructed under the Roman Emperor Constantine around 327, and the early church met in homes. The pulpit was a piece of stagecraft borrowed from Greek culture in which professional speakers delivered monologues in public debates. And there's no evidence that Jesus, the apostles, or other leaders in the early church used a pulpit. It seems to have been introduced into Christian circles somewhere around the mid third century. So the idea, and we've all heard this, or at least a lot of us in more evangelical circles have heard the, the sanctity of the platform being pre, uh, protected or the um, sacred desk. I've heard the pulpit called the sacred desk. Um, yeah, that's just made up. <laughs> it's not a thing. And the order of the modern worship service originated in Roman Catholic Mass under Pope Gregory in the 6th century. And that came out of a mix of Judaism as well as um, paganism. Preaching a sermon to an audience was ushered into the church world late in the 2nd century. 
Sermons were an extension of the activity of the Greek sophists who had mastered the art of rhetorical oratory. So basically they went around giving speeches uh, and teaching for money. <laughs> Sounds kind of familiar. There were no pastors as an official or a director of a group of believers until sometime in the second century. And that was eventually furthered by the practice of ordination, which was based on the prevailing Roman custom of appointing men to public office. Even the biblical approach to communion or the Lord's Supper was reduced in the late second century from a full communal meal. I mean, if you think about the Last Supper, it was a feast. They were all there together. Um, and so it was reduced from the full feast meal without clergy officiating to what we commonly do now, which is sipping a little, little bit of wine or juice, depending on your group, <laughs> and a little piece of bread under the guidance of recognized clergy. And so we really can't point to scripture for a lot of what we do now, at least not exactly the way we do it. And I don't actually think there's anything wrong with the way that churches have adapted and integrated these practices into the structure of their services. But there's no scriptural support to condemn those of us who choose not to participate within their structures and institutions. Scripture doesn't say how often we should gather. I mean, there's one place in Acts where it mentions that they gather daily, but, you know, that wasn't a command or the norm anywhere else. And so while that example does exist within Scripture, it's not prescriptive for how to meet. Thank goodness. Can you imagine having to meet every day? Like, <laughs> I mean, we're busy. Gathering in Scripture seems to have a measure of freedom to it. There's no mention of where to gather, how often the service structure, how many people must be present, you know, it's almost like it can be done in a big building with a crowd or, you know, around your dining room table with some friends or even out in a canoe on the river with a friend and your fishing rods. And, um, you know, that freedom of gathering allows everyone to easily participate throughout every historical time, culture, and location. And that makes sense. Listening to some people, you would almost think the purpose of the gospel and the mandate of scripture was to establish the institutional church. And it wasn't. Uh, God was building his family, not an institution. If he was, he'd have outlined the structure much more clearly. I mean, looking at the specifications for the tabernacle in the Old Testament, God's pretty detail-oriented when he feels like something's important to him. The North American church has a warped view that everyone just lives like us and the way we do everything is the right way. And so obviously if you don't do it like us, well, you must be doing it wrong. But God's not North American, nor is he bound by our narrow cultural thinking. If we look at scripture, how did they gather? Well, they gathered pretty practically actually. In Acts chapter 2, they broke bread from house to house. Acts 20 verse 20 mentions Peter teaching in public and then also from house to house. Acts 542 mentions open-air teachings in the temple courts. Um, if you think back to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, chapters 5 through 7, it seems pretty casual and organic. I mean, you just had Jesus sitting on the mountainside teaching. They also gathered in large banquet rooms, if you think Acts chapter 2, and even also uh, the Last Supper, which were probably in wealthy people's homes. Now, home church is commonly mentioned in scripture. 1 Corinthians 16, 19 mentions the one that Priscilla and Aquila hosted. 1 Corinthians 1, 11 refers to the house fellowship that Chloe hosted. Philemon 1, 2 mentions another one. There's several other mentions. It was actually that reference to Chloe's uh, group that points to denominations never being a part of God's plan. They seem counterproductive to him establishing his family or the church or the ecclesia. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, they were already dividing up into factions and Paul was quick to rebuke them and promote unity. And I mean, isn't that just human nature for you? And it's similar to denominations now. Look, 
in my opinion, as long as we agree on the basics of the gospel. And what is that? Well, Romans 3.10 says we have a sin problem. And Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So God sent his son, Jesus, who came willingly to take our punishment. He paid our fine, so to speak. He paid that wage that we owed for our sin so that we wouldn't have to. And so he paid the penalty with his death on the cross and then his burial and his resurrection overcame death for us and granted us eternal life. And John 3, 16 says, if we believe that Jesus did this, that he, that the son of God came and did this for us and we place our faith in him, we receive what is called substitutionary atonement and substitutionary atonement just means that I was supposed to be punished for this thing, but that Jesus was my substitute. He stepped in, he took my punishment for me. And in return, he gave me his righteousness or his right standing with God, his perfection. And so it was an awesome trade for me. It was not such a great trade for him, but he loved us. So it was worth it. And uh, substitutionary atonement, you'll find that verse in 2 Corinthians 5.21. And we are justified by faith not by works, Romans 4, 3 through 5. And honestly, beyond that, I don't think we need to be drawn dividing lines based on secondary issues. And I get it. There's no doubt we're going to disagree on things. And there's all kinds of different interpretations of, of how that plays out. But the reality is we're a family and we don't have to agree on everything to love each other. 1 John 5, 1 says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. And the early church had an axiom that I heard, and I thought it was so neat. I loved it, so I'm going to read it to you. And it says, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity or love. And that needs to be our approach to how we love and deal with one another. Um, Christianity is about our response to the gospel and our faith in the finished work of, of the cross. It's Christ in us, our only hope of eternal life. And gathering was recommended for our benefit, but it was not the center of our faith. Christ is the center. And I've heard people say, well, you know, you have to go to church. How else will you learn? Well, well, you can read your Bible and you can study and you can watch teaching. I mean, let's be honest, it's never been easier. We have access to so much now. And then I've heard people come back and say, well, you know, but there's so much out there. How do you keep from getting confused? Well, I mean, I would contend that the same thing can happen in a church. I've heard some crazy stuff taught over pulpits. And I would say that this is where your Christian community comes into play, be it traditional church community, be it an online community, be it a home group community. I have a wonderful ladies Bible study and you run things by other people who are, you know, full of the Holy Spirit and they're, and they're just studying and they want to know God. And I think that it's an easy way. Also, there will be elders in your life who can guide you. But I don't think we need to be as afraid of being confused and let off into false doctrine as we think. Um, I know that a lot of them say, well, if you miss traditional church, that, you know, you'll, you'll die spiritually. Well, look, if you miss a few church services and you can't survive spiritually, I'd say your spiritual leaders and mentors have failed you. Discipleship's important early on in conversion, but the goal of discipleship is to help you mature and to equip you to make disciples. So it's like a self-perpetuating system. And by not teaching you to feed yourself spiritually and to take responsibility for your own faith, you know, you can come to a place where you don't know why you believe what you do, other than the fact that it's what your pastor teaches and it's what your church believes. And, you know, people could tell you almost anything and you would believe it because you're not testing what you're being taught. 
you know, you're almost placing your faith in your pastor or your church. I think people get into that for a couple of reasons. I think people are a little bit afraid. I think they're sometimes being taught to be afraid of being let off into false doctrine. And so they're very intimidated by scripture. And that, that makes me feel bad. But I also think there's another side to it where people, uh, it's just what they want. They don't want the responsibility of seeking and hearing from God themselves or, you know, studying and learning on their own. They'd sort of just rather show up. For church each week and have a pastor do all that work for them because it's easier, you know, just sort of tell me what to do and I'll do it. But that's not modeled in scripture anywhere for Christians. And it can be very dangerous, in my opinion. If you look at the children of Israel in 1 Samuel 8, God wanted to lead them. He was doing it. He was speaking through the prophets, telling them whatever he wanted them to do. But they wanted a king. Uh, And God warned them, look, It's not a good idea. A king is going to tax you. He's going to make your kids go to work for him. And they didn't care. It was just easier that way. They wanted a king. So God, in his infinite love and patience with us human beings, (laughs) he allowed for an inferior system of institutional government, you know, earthly leaders. But that was never his plan. And it's also worth noting, if you go back and read through the Old Testament, those kings were the ruination of the nation of Israel at that time. And many of them were corrupt and they led the children of Israel off into idolatry and away from God. And they just blindly followed them. So Israel's desire for a human king or leader was actually kind of a rejection of God as their king. And when I look at how extreme some modern church structures are, it's pretty similar And in my opinion, some of them are being led off into idolatry as well. But the, you know, the idol or the golden calf is celebrity like pastors. People are worshiping the pastor and the church institution itself, be it your denomination or your, you know, what your denomination believes is different from other groups. And that's where the pride and the, and the, almost the worship falls. And we need to be very careful of that. Outsourcing responsibility for our faith is unwise and it's unbiblical. The Holy Spirit is our guide. You know, we depend on him. First John 2 27 says, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you, but his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie. Just as it has taught you, abide in him, abide in Christ. John 14, 26 says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have told you. So the Holy Spirit, how how do I know if it's a voice of the Holy Spirit in my life? Well, is it pointing you to Jesus? Because if it's pointing you to Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit. And we have one true leader. And it's our responsibility to follow him, you know, and that's not to say that we can't take encouragement or even teaching and insight from earthly examples, as long as they're following Christ. But the second they misstep, we walk on because they were never our leader anyway. Our eyes are fixed on Jesus Christ. We only have one king. Hi guys, so this video ran a little bit long and I decided to divide it up into two parts. And so if you'd like to see the second part, you can keep an eye out for that. And if you enjoyed this video and uh, you know, you want to hit the like button or the dislike button, (laughs) you can do that and it kind of helps me in the algorithm so that YouTube's more likely to uh, recommend my video in search. And um, If you'd like for YouTube to notify you whenever I put out a new one, you can hit the subscribe button and the little notification bell and they will do that. So I hope you have a great day.